This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Deep South Dining, the show all about the culture of Southern flavor and the good folks that love to stir the pot. Good morning, Malcolm White with Carol Palmer. We will be your host this morning. We are glad you have joined us. We're going to talk about a trip to the coast that Carol and I took this past weekend and all that went on there. But today we have our very special friend from Italy, Elaine Trigiani, will join us after 20 years in Italy. She has designed experiences, and she's in the olive oil business, and she's going to tell us all about that. We'll talk about pasta, wine, olive oil, but mostly we're going to talk about Sicily. Good morning. Welcome to Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio. We're glad you're tuned in. Good morning, Carol. Morning, Mal. Look who we have in the studio. I know. We have our friend Elaine Trigiani. Happy to be here. She came a long way to join us this morning. She came all the way from Italy or Italy, as, as some known, say in Mississippi. Well, you and I had a big coast weekend, Carol. Ooh, we are whooped. I did Mardi Gras, and we did dinner, and you did a panel. Tell us about what, yeah, what you did. Yeah, I did uh, a panel at the Writers' Exchange. There, uh, The Hancock Library System put on a wonderful event. It was like a mini book fest, and uh, I moderated the cookbook panel. And my authors were Martha Foose, whose book Sweet Tea um, is in Screen Screen Doors, Doors is, you know, won the American Best American Cookbook for the James Beard Awards. Right. As did I Am From Here by Vish Wish Bot of Snack Bar in Oxford. And, you know, that's pretty amazing to have. So you had both of them on your panel. Mississippi chefs whose books have won. Best American Cookbook. And then our friend uh, Ernest Foundas, who was with us last week, a a New Orleanian, a lawyer by day and chef by night and mad food scientist on the weekend (laughs) with the Tiki Food Lab. Uh, Ernest doesn't have a book, but he's in the middle of writing a book. So it was a very lively conversation. And I just can't say enough about the event. Uh, and it it will grow and grow, and uh, I don't know how it could have been much better, but I'm just spreading the word near and far because it was excellent. Was it at the library, or where was it? It was at the Hancock County Performing Arts Center, Okay, part of Hancock County High School, a gorgeous facility. Mm, good. Well, that's great. So you you had Martha and Vish on and and, and Ernest, Ernest. Mm-hmm. all on your panel. I did. Yeah. And I Ernest did. did, a, did Ernest do some sort of demonstration? Or he something? had demo? a table and mm-hmm. was doing little yeah you know, demos. He was doing his like you know fermenting and and growing. And you remember he told us he actually fermented a king cake. <laughs> Elaine, this guy <laughs> pretty wild. said I'm in the I'm in the middle of fermenting. A, a last year's king, well, not last year's, but I'm in the middle of fermenting a king cake to make miso, miso, which I'm going to use to make a king cake out of. This guy is is <laughs> he he is into zero waste. That's his whole thing. So he and his wife had a king cake last Mardi Gras, and they had some of it left over. And because they're zero waste people, they're ooh, what do we do with our king cake? That's going to be umami, umami king cake. <laughs> Yes, yeah. and it, it is. It is indeed. But Malcolm, we started off the weekend in a big way. We did. At the restaurant Vestige in Ocean Springs. We did. We, we had- were there Friday night, and on Thursday, Vestige was named to the James Beard semifinal list for best restaurant in the country, Ocean Springs, Mississippi. And we also had another uh, restaurant make the semifinals Elvis from here in Jackson yeah Bellhaven but we had uh, best just, chef south yes uh, Hunter, Hunter Evans Evans correct 
but it, it was a it was a fun dinner. Not at all what I had expected in my mind. It was, you know, t- it was a, a a set menu with you know tiny little courses. Just everything was packed with layers and layers of flavor. Yeah, it was really quite good, and that was my second time to eat there. And it, what it, it's a prefixed menu. It's five courses with with bread and butter in the middle. And the only decisions you make as a diner there is what beverages you would like. And I thought they had a very impressive cocktail and wine list. It was small, but you were sort of yeah, struck by pre- some, of the, some of the varieties. Yeah, I was pretty uh, excited about having Slovenian wine on a Mississippi wine list. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. There were some it, Italians as well. Yeah, but it, it was very um, curated and edited and the chef is alex perry and he was just delightful came out and sat at the table with us and we just we had a great conversation yeah he's a big music uh collector java he he's a metal head and he collects vinyl i mean this is just his hobby right so he goes to he loves live shows and record stores he knows all about all the record stores in the south and uh, he he's really interesting in terms of other than being a chef of the things that he's interested in. Was it incorporated in the meal in any kind of way? I didn't think so. But once he sat and talked to us for a long time, you could sort of see where he was coming from with a lot of his choices of ingredients and the way that he he paired and married things. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, very it was a delightful meal, and congratulations. I know, we were rocking and rolling, I mean, we were. during the meal. <laughs> congratulations to the two Mississippi uh, semifinalists, uh, Vestige, and for Hunter Evans at Best Chef South at Elvis in Jackson. Well, then after we had our meal, Carol, we, we both went back to Ocean Springs. We stayed at the old Gulf Hills Hotel in the old Guff Hills Dude Ranch, Dude Ranch <laughs> famously patronized by Elvis back in the day. There are photographs of Elvis riding horses and water skiing all over the, the structure. And then I was off to Mardi Gras in Ocean Springs with the Walter Anderson Museum of Art crew de canoe. And uh, Robert St. John was our captain of our Mardi Gras crew. And we were about 50 or 60 strong, and we had a big canoe float, and we had a blast riding through the Mardi Gras parade there in downtown Ocean Springs. And you— I got a we, taste of it because you accidentally <laughs> dialed you me. me. It was that. a pocket <laughs> dial, and I say I'm driving back, you know, while he's having fun. I'm eating Doritos in the car, <laughs> not having had breakfast or lunch, and— call from Malcolm and it comes over the car speakerphone and it's just a band. <laughs> Lots of big horns and do 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 and I'm you know yelling yeah, Malcolm. Hey, Malcolm. So <laughs> when I realized what was going on I just left it on. Let it go. Let it go. Yeah we had a big time. Uh and that was our first time uh at Walter Anderson to to have a float and it was really good. But the day before I had lunch uh with the director of the Anderson, Julian Rankin, and we ate at a service station. Uh, it's a Marathon Oil service station uh, in Ocean Springs, but there is this great seafood outlet inside the service station called Fayards, and they serve dressed and pressed po' boys, gumbo, and fried seafood, and another variety. But we had delicious seafood uh, po' boys. I had a shrimp. Julian had the shrimp and oyster. And I posted that and got a lot of comments about that. You know, down there, uh, po' boys are ubiquitous, really. And the dressed and pressed is kind of my favorite. Elaine, you are you a po' boy aficionado? I agree on dressed and pressed. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I would go half and half. I think I would go for half oyster, half catfish. I'll tell you what my dilemma was. I couldn't. It took me a while. I couldn't decide between soft shell crab. Oh, my God. And okay, shrimp. that's what I would have, yes. They also have the famous crab meat po' boy on the coast. It's often referred to as a Van Cleave special. It's a crab meat dressing put on as the protein in the po' boy. And then there's often cheese added. And um, in the old days, Rossetti's, a little po' boy shop on the point in Biloxi, 
served and trademarked the uh, Van Cleef special. But now there are many other versions of this. Henrietta's in Ocean Springs used to do it. Fayards does it. Uh, quality seafood in Gulfport has what is left of the Rossetti family tradition in there. They do the same thing. But anyway, I love these po' boys. They're quirky and uh, very uh, native of, of that part of the world. And you love getting them at a gas station. Who wouldn't? Speaking of which, did you see the New York Times piece yes. this morning? Yes. Yeah, speaking of gas stations, our fellow Mississippian, Kate Medley, whose book, Thank You, Please Come Again, is a photographic journal of gas stations, had a major write-up in the New York Times this week. And, uh, How about that, Java? How about that, Java? Murrah shines again. You tell them. <laughs> yeah, tell them. Java Murrah and Kate were in the same again. class. Well, in the same years. Yeah, we Murrah. were there at the same time. She was a senior and I was a freshman, so... But we were there at the same time. We shared the same space. (laughs) Excellent. And we have an upcoming show with Kate Medley. Yeah, we were actually able to get her in the studio. um, And we're going to share that sometime in February. But, you know, Mississippians, here we are all over the place. New York Times, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. So I brought you all a little treat this morning besides, well, I actually brought two treats. I brought a king cake from the Loblolly Bakery in Hattiesburg. And Carol, you had Martha on your panel, and you also stopped at Loblolly. It was a going or coming thing. When I was coming back to Jackson, I stopped, and the shelves were bare. Shelves were bare. They were so bare that I have photographic evidence to show you of how well well Loblolly Bakery (laughs) is doing. And Martha told me that they can't keep the king cake. She said they have sold thousands. She said the other day they sold fifty nine in three minutes. Do they take yeah. orders, or do you have to be lucky? I think must be present to win. Yeah, when I was there Sunday morning on my way back, mm-hmm. I had a little breakfast and a, I got a box of pastries, and then I was texting with Robert. We were sort of wrapping up our Mardi Gras experience and just talking in general. And he said, "Be sure and get a blueberry." king cake before you leave he said they'll go fast there may not even be any there so i got one i brought it in this morning java have you had a chance to uh sample uh yes i have and- <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was a question the answer was it was a given it was a well-known given have I you have, finished your piece already? i have okay. I've, I've done more than sample <laughs> Java, I'm so glad that you and I, tie, you know, are on this show because here we have these two people who eat all the time. They're thin as rails. I, I don't they get it. They would not be eating the king cake. But I take while, it all while they are, you know, here, you and I have about polished off. I take it all in stride. But this, um, the, this king cake with the with the blueberry inside. Mm. I actually got a blueberry, which was like really really nice because you usually get the. Uh, the almond cream yeah. um, feeling. Yeah. I'm so in a different was, direction. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Now, also, another treat that I brought, um, I got this also at Fayards. These these are on display by the cash register, and they are the old Hubig fried pies. The Hubig, Hubig pies that I grew up thinking were native to New Orleans, uh, but we did a little research, Carol. It turns out they're Texan Mr. by Hubig, birth. Sam, Samuel Hubig opened his first place. In Texas, mm-hmm. but you know, in 2012, the New Orleans factory burned to the ground. It was a real tragedy. Well, even before that, all of the bakeries throughout the South all perished in the Great Depression, except for the one in New Orleans. And I guess that's the reason I thought they were of New Orleans. So, well, I mean, I, I think we can say they are of New Orleans. They are now. now. They are now. Yeah. Java, have you dug in yet? No, I'm actually going to save this because I, I, I know what it tastes like. And it's just so fascinating where I think some people, like just by the sound <laughs> of the packaging. It's a you trigger. Know, it sound, yeah, it's somebody <laughs> salivating. <laughs> yep. it, the and you're a also. fried pie guy because... Your your it was your grandmother either made them or brought them to you from yeah, Oxford. Yeah, my great aunt Aunt Dilsey, she's maybe listening this morning. Good morning, Aunt Dilsey. But um, yeah, holidays are filled with fried pies, and she can't come down the road, or we can't go up to her without me getting some fried pies for the holidays. Well, that's great. So 
couple of sweet treats. Uh, but, Carol, on Saturday night after the Mardi Gras parade, I had dinner for the first time since it's reopened and been completely renovated and uh, has a new direction. The White Pillars in Biloxi, old traditional restaurant. Used to eat there. My, mm-hmm. With my parents, my family, and then later on in life, they were famous for the eggplant Josephine dish, which was which was well known. But anyway, now it's 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 a new operation, totally renovated, um, really nice, busy. That place was packed, uh, but that was my first time. I had an amberjack entree, had two amazing uh, oyster appetizers. One was a baked oyster. Uh, and these are those French her- hermit hermit uh, oysters, you know, that they, they mm-hmm. raise down on the coast. One was fried with a, a cucumber sauce. It was delicious, and the other one was baked. But it was really good, and uh, if you've heard, I, I think they were nominated last year for a James Beard. Am I right about that? I don't know. I don't, I don't, know. I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah. But anyway. Have you, have but you I don't remember a lot. <laughs> have you been to White Pillars yet? I have, I have okay. not. I am just so thrilled that they saved that building. I mean, it took years and years and years. Renovation. It was going to be torn down so many times, and that's a real treasure. And our last tidbit in the first segment here is uh, a friend of mine recently told me he was going to meet his daughter in Corinth and they were going to have lunch and they were going to have a cornbread salad. And I I sort of I thought, hmm, I don't know about the cornbread salad. So I thought we needed to figure that out. So I did a posting on cooking and coping on our website. Got a lot of responses. Uh, Turns out the cornbread salad is, as one would think, Elaine, a southern thing. For sure. But yeah. it sounds like a southern, southern thing. Is it, is, really, is it from the southern part of the state? Because I'm unfamiliar with it as well. I think it's southern as in the American South. Okay. Where cornbread it's is king, me. right? Right. So this is taking cornbread and making a salad out of it. Well, I'm calling it southern panzanella. Exactly. I know I think Mississippi panzanella because the Italian bread salad is, is one of my favorites. Exactly. So why not a cornbread salad? Yeah, why not? Well, but obviously we were behind, behind the curve, Malcolm. Malcolm, we failed. Folks on Cooking and Coping know about the cornbread uh, salad and there are several recipes on our site if you're interested. Lots of comments about where to get it. There's one comment that it's on the lunch menu at Walker's. So I don't know. Um, and there were, Tim Pierce uh, talked about it. Uh, there's who was it you said posted a re- somebody posted a recipe? Well, somebody yeah posted the recipe from a Square Table, the wonderful Oxford cookbook. And then we heard April McGregor from Philadelphia, PA, by right. way of Vardaman, Mississippi. She was all had over a lot it. of a lot of conversation about it. So it's a very lively conversation. Go on Facebook to Cooking and Coping, and among other things, you'll read about cornbread salad. You can learn about the cornbread salad, or you can make a comment about the cornbread salad. And today, all the way from Italy, we have, <laughs> I like to say that, from Italy, <laughs> ladies Bonjour and gentlemen. <laughs> Elaine Trigiani has joined us again. Thanks so much for coming in this morning, Elaine. I'm happy to be here. Thanks we for the invitation. We're always happy to have you on this show. And when you come home, and you only come home maybe twice a year, once a year. Twice. I work on twice. Mm-hmm. But we're glad you're here. And um, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about your olive oil. <clears throat> we uh, got our shipment. We did. And, and man, have I enjoyed yes. it. Yes. You know, the problem with getting your oil... Is I feel compelled to share it with everybody. (laughs) So I get, I think I'm ordering, you know, four or five bottles and that's going to hold me to the next time. And I, somebody will ask me about it and I just give them a bottle. Well, Malcolm, (laughs) you can, can, I appreciate the PR and you can always get more. You know where, you know where it comes from. I do. I'm not out yet. (laughs) I was was actually gifted some for Christmas. Oh boy. Cindy Hannon and Trish Williams gave John and me a bottle for Christmas. Excellent. Nice. But anyway, they're they're very different. Uh, talk about the two oils of Elaine Trigiani. So I, yeah, I make two olive oils because, as we like to say, olive oil is not one size fits all. So I live in Tuscany, so I make an, a Tuscan olive oil, which is very grassy and peppery. And I have family in Sicily 
So I also make a Sicilian oil. And because of the, the varieties of olives that are grown down there um, and just their climate and you know, differences in soil and whatnot, those um, oils in particular um, are much fruitier. So they're kind of fruity and spicy as opposed to the grassy and peppery. Ah, and I'll tell you, I before I got these oils, I mean, of course, I've been using olive oil for years. But, you know, you get what you get around here. There's some pretty good ones. They're not great. But uh, now that I get these fine oils, uh, I use them for finishing. I, I used to not ha- think of olive oil uh, as a finisher. I mean, I put it on top of salads. I put it on top of soups. I put it on top of my entrees. after Right before I... After I make a plate and I'm getting ready to go sit down to eat, I just, I've taken it. I just put it all over everything as well. Yeah, I hoard it, too. I mean, I, yeah, you don't put it in the frying pan. No, no, of course You're not. not. Gonna, I, I mean, use the other olive, stuff I know, for that. I, I know, but it's with Elaine that's so precious, you finish with it. That's right. I, since I have a lifetime supply, I fly, I fry with it also. Well, of but course I you understand do. that. So yeah, and it it really has this ability to pump up flavors and really kind of create harmony with with the flavors that it that you you know any dish it kind of brings everything together, and it has it has a presence, but it also tends to just kind of help everybody play together. I think that's exactly right. And uh, so how is that going? Where are you in the season? I know you. You grow, you have farmers, you do processing, then bottling and mm-hmm. shipping. Where are you in the olive oil uh, timeline? Well, we harvested in um, October and harvested and milled. We milled within just really several hours. So mm-hmm. the oil is um, all in-house now and we're shipping it out. So if anybody wants any, you know where to go. Um, and right now, winter, tell them where to go. You can go to... Olio della Donna dot com. And you are going to have to spell that. <laughs> I will, and I think Java is gonna put it up on the notes, program notes for this uh, okay. for this session. It's Olio O L I O Della D E L L A Donna, like the like the women's name, um, dot com. So you can find all information there. And we also have a um, you can order directly from the farm from me in Italy or you can order from some of our resellers. And there is information on the website about that as well. Um, So we are working. We've worked up some new packaging. I'm very happy about we have some um, sustainable packaging. No more styrofoam. What about about that styrofoam you were throwing off the top of the building to see? That was not styrofoam. That was my this is the new package. That was my crash test on my new packaging. (laughs) So we have some. um, kind of custom designed cardboard bottle inserts in some nice sturdy nice sturdy boxes and I did in fact toss it off of a um, second floor window and it held up just fine so we're I'm very happy about that so um, that was sort of a project of last year and then now we're just about to start um, pruning trees and um, you know putting out fertilizer and getting ready for the spring growing season. So I have a new, I'm very happy about a new little olive grove that I have, which is a recovery project. It's kind of like when you you know see a stray dog and you can't help it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this was a stray olive grove and he <laughs> needed me. And so I'm about to jump into that. It'll be a couple of years before we get any olives, I think, out of that grove because we really have to reform the tree if they've been abandoned. So. How many trees are in the uh, rescue grove? The rescue grove has about 200 trees. And what is the typical size of a grove that you either own and operate out of or lease or buy from? Or I mean, Mine what's are, a grove? I mean, typically, what is a grove? It just kind of depends on the really the morphology of the terrain. Italy is mostly full of, um, you know, has a lot of small family farms, but there are bigger olive oil producers who, in fact, work very, very well. In areas where there is um, kind of easier, you know, terrain that's easier to be farmed. So where I live, there are very small properties because it's extremely hilly um, and it's hard to get an extension of groves. But in the south, in Sicily and in um, Puglia, for example, you can get some, um, you know, there's a lot of acreage devoted to olives. Well, um for our listeners, is do you have a minimum order? I mean, when you when you go on this website, I mean, can, you can't just order a bottle or two well, bottles. Or how does can't. that work? It's coming a long way. It's coming a long way, and shipping's expensive. So there's a minimum order of three bottles, and okay. you can place an order for any multiple of three bottles, three, six, nine, and on up. 
Um, and if you just need less than that, you can always go to one of our U.S. retailers. And I'm trying to, I'm actually, I'm here to visit family and friends, of course, but I'm also working on um, trying to um, expand our distribution. So hopefully mm. we'll have some more retailers here in the U.S. soon. Great. So, you know, we are a show about Southern flavor, Southern things. What, 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 how is your life in Italy like or dislike growing up in the South? Are there any Southern traits that you've brought over there that, that you can identify? Or is it just a different life? It's an Italian lifestyle. Well, it's definitely a different lifestyle, but, you know, you can take the girl out of the South, but, and, you know, if you grew up here, that's, you know, it's sort of ingrained. So I definitely feel um, that I'm a product of Mississippi, mm-hmm. for sure. So You've just changed from grits to polenta. I have changed from grits to polenta. I will make polenta cornbread, however, because, mm-hmm. of course, we're basically talking about the same thing. Um, I will fry up some green tomatoes, although I've learned some other good things to do with green tomatoes that the Italians do. So that's interesting. So, you know, we all use green tomatoes. Well, tell us about that. They, this is uh, a typical um, recipe from down near Naples. And they, you know, it's, um, you know, they put them up for winter kind of thing. Um, And they're actually, they're great. And they last all winter long. And they take green tomatoes and um, they let them uh, kind of drain under salt so some of the liquid comes out, which I think mm-hmm. makes it difficult to can something. They parboil them really quickly and not even boil. They dunk them in um, vinegar, basically, and then put them up under olive oil. And you have these jars of these tangy little treats. Great all winter long, really good with a steak or something. And then the olive oil kind of picks up some of the, the yummy tomatoey flavors. And it's, just, it's great on bread or even on top of your steak. You can use that. So wow. it's a fun recipe. And it's on my website, by the way. So you can also um, make it yourself with your last, you know, have a, you know, tomatoes at a certain point don't ripen anymore. And what are you going to do with all your nice green tomatoes? So that's one really good thing to do with them. So check out the, my website and you can get the recipe for Naples style green tomatoes. And tell us where you're, tell us about the website so that folks can go there. You can go to, that's, I believe that one's on oleodelladonna.com. Okay. There's also a lot of recipes on elainetrigiani.com. So I'm actually manning two uh, websites, not to be confusing, but there you go. And I've got a lot of Sicilian recipes on there, um, which are, you know, Southern Italian recipes. And mm-hmm. I, my family's from Sicily, so I, I really feel this linkage with the South. The South and the South, we all have something kind of in common. So um, there's definitely, you know, something in the air down there. Yeah. I remember in Greece, you know, the further south we went, the more it felt like where we were from. You know, I, it, I don't right. know. I can't exactly explain it. The food changed a little. The people are nicer. The people were a little more what nicer. They, they looked you in the eye. Right. And it was a little more hospitable. Friendly greetings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was funny. I, it, I, I picked up on that immediately when we were, well, that was a long time ago, but... Uh, now, are you still doing the cooking classes and the demos on your web I do, websites? I do some virtual visits online. We do a, a Zoom presentation, and they're art and f- food focused. It's a virtual visit to Italy, so it's like a little mini visit to Italy. Um, I'm down to quarterly presentations these days, but all of our – we started off during the pandemic when all of us had more time on our hands, and, and we would go twice a month. So the archive, the video archive, is available on the ElaineTrigioni.com website um, if y'all are interested in any of that. And you can always feel, – feel free to fast forward. I won't be offended because I'll just never know. Um, but <laughs> if you are more interested in the cooking than the art, you can, um, you can get to the, to the recipe part. I, I just have to say that the art part – is fascinating. I would suggest that no one fast forward Thank you, through Carol. that because you really well well first of all you're you're a great educator. Thank you. But you can tell how much work went into that art presentation. Well, I by nature go into the minutia. It's my I can't help it. So I delve into the trees. I don't see the forest. I mean I do that in these art presentations. But it really sets, you know, sets it up for the cooking. To, to get into the area, to the region, to get a feel for it. Well, and Italy is so great that way. And, um, and, and I mean, every most cultures obviously maintain their cooking traditions, but um, each little each little area there are these distinctive areas in 
Italy, that they all have, they all maintain these culinary traditions. And honestly, you can get in the car and drive 30 minutes and find a new one. So um, it's it's really interesting um, and kind of ripe for the picking as far as, you know, finding cool recipes to match up with a place. And you really kind of get a, a good view of um, how people live over there. And then the cooking demonstration is actually done in your kitchen. And you know, the lighting, I mean, just it really does give, give a feeling of being there. It's kind of homey. I know people tell me that. They feel like they really have taken a, a quick visit to Italy. So, yeah, we invite you into my kitchen. And my um, sidekick, Lorenzo, sometimes he either cooks or makes some comments or whatnot. He's actually going to help me lead this uh, trip to Puglia that we have coming in the fall. And we'll be doing that again next year as well. Um, so that's kind of a fun uh, collaboration. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about your trips, the in-person trips, not the virtual trips that you do online. So we also do in-person group trips. They're um, small groups, uh, maximum 12 people. And I have done a similar trip with Carol as my sidekick, mm-hmm. and we were in, Sic- in Sicily. That was a long time ago. When was that, 2011? Yeah, some sometime around there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm pre-pandemic for sure. And I'm currently um, doing trips to um, Tuscany, Sicily, and Puglia, information on elainetrigiani.com. And so we take small groups to discover these regions, and I really try to get you off the beaten path and kind of open a window onto how people live there and how they eat and why and you meet food producers and a cheese maker or a wine maker olive oil makers that kind of thing and you know we enjoy lovely meals and have cooking um, experiences and um, so the idea is to just kind of it's not splashy and flashy at all it's kind of homey again that's kind of the style I go for so you you may be in some I remember Carol and I were in this woman's kitchen it was a restaurant but it was just so home style they literally had. Remember that one little serrated knife. We they have shared? talked about that on the show. We talked. <laughs> we we've talked about it twice in the in the past months. How she operated this big restaurant, and she and her daughter had one knife that did. And I, I just think and it of, was a table knife. <laughs> and uh, our friend Tim Pierce, you may have met through cooking and coping mm-hmm, from memphis mm-hmm. actually sent us it's from boonville a, oh, a knife a knife it was a victoria knox right it's serrated like that, right. A serrated knife like right. that but that was the one one of the wonders um but well, i've done just, two of your tri- i've done tuscany right and uh and then and then sicily and they they are they're intimate they're homegrown i mean you you feel like you know i mean you're just sitting on a stool in somebody's kitchen right and exactly it's it's not like get off the bus go in the lobby of the you know that exactly. type of exactly exactly and sometimes you know producers will have, have us in for a tasting and you know their mom will cook for us in the end that kind of thing i mean it's definitely um, kind of very low key and homey, but uh, my goal really is to kind of just give you an idea of um, really how people are living and eating. Um, we also see, um, you know, monuments of art and art history, of course, because that's my original, um, my first job, former life. So um, we work that in, you know, where logistically, where it logistically fits in, and um, we just really try to keep a. We usually have a kind of a packed schedule, but I like to make it feel kind of relaxed. So um, they're fun trips. I also do this for groups of friends. I think that was the first trip that um, we did together, Carol, with a group of friends. Well, this, this you know, girls. actually, Bo, I mean, the first one, I got together a group of mm-hmm. friends to go to Tuscany. And the second trip was a group of friends who actually booked the trip through Viking. Okay, you know, they okay, got, okay. got together. It was a group. Of friends that every year they go uh, they go on a trip and they were they were just you know they were they were fascinating. But Malcolm and I have been talking about Sicily because he really wants you know wants to go and uh, yeah, I feel like we haven't talked enough about the difference in Sicilian uh, Sicilian food and Sicilian culture on the show, but. I wanted to say that as Mississippians, we are very tied to Sicily because the Italians in the Mississippi Delta came from there. They uh, started coming in the 1880s. They brought them in to repair levees Mm. and work on farms, and they did not like that. (laughs) 
you know, atta- they don't like they you know they ended up opening grocery stores right. and restaurants, and then in the thirties. Another wave came, and they were uh, mostly from the Chefalu area, mm-hmm. which uh, is that on the south coast? Of, That's on the north coast the, of Sicily. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, sort of, yeah, northwest, north coast of Sicily, kind of between Palermo and Messina. Okay. Well, the Sicilian immigrants in Mississippi have been a huge part of our culture. Yeah, we we frequent their restaurants mm-hmm. still. They're in the second, third, fourth generations. Uh but just some of the great citizens of Mississippi, mm-hmm. especially in the Mississippi Delta. There was also the Mississippi Delta, but you know, really, this area has such an influx of Sicilians because there was mass immigration out of um, out of southern Italy uh, because of poverty in the late 1800s. Um, and there was a direct steamship line also from Palermo to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So the, mm-hmm. the, the Delta, uh, the original um, Italian immigrants came over and Sicilian immigrants came over to work, as you said, uh, with that specific kind of work program. And I don't think they were necessarily treated very well, unfortunately. But lots of other ones... Um, Lots of other folks from southern Italy and Sicily decided on their own to you know, immigrate and um, took the steamship over to New Orleans and worked their way up the Mississippi River on steamboats. Hmm. And our food has been the better for it, and our culture has been the better for it. But tell us the difference, you know, what, what people think you know, uh, from seeing The Godfather in the, about Sicilian food, that it's all pasta and red sauce. So give us a little feel of Sicilian food. Well, as we're sitting here talking, actually, you know, think about food in the Delta and the influxes of cultures that have come through there. And, you know, there's Mexican influence, there's Sicilian influence, there's Lebanese influence, and there's, you know, native population influence. And Sicily is very similar to that. Um, Sicily is kind of the last frontier of Italy, it's not at all. If, you know, if you've been to Rome and Florence and Venice, then, you know, hold on because it's not that at all. And the food culture really reflects their history as the, and this is said, this is kind of a trite phrase, the crossroads of the Mediterranean. But, you know, it sounds like a cruise ship. But it actually, <laughs> it actually was, it was, you know, the, the Mediterranean uh, was kind of the known world for the Roman Empire, right? So there was a lot going on in the Mediterranean basin, and Sicily is right in the middle of the Mediterranean. So any of these kind of great um, ancient empires who wanted to control trade in the known world had to have control of Sicily. So lots of, um, you know, in, in addition to the native tribes that were there, um, the Phoenicians came through there. They were these mighty um, maritime traders. And um, the Greeks, Romans, had settlements. Romans Arabs, had settlements. Yes. Even the Vikings way before that. The Normans came down there. <laughs> there was a lot. The Spanish were there for 500 years. There's a little French influx at one point. There's And so and here's another um, tie back to our um, previous um, segment. And I always use this word when I talk about cuisine in Sicily vestiges all of them left you know the vestige uh, so there, you can really kind of analyze the very complicated history of this of this place um, just looking at um, the foods that they eat are the governments different are the permits different is there <clears throat> between what we know of as Italy and Sicily they have an autonomous parliament so they are fairly autonomous for certain things. I mean, they're definitely uh, a region of Italy, and they're, in fact, the largest recent region of Italy. But they have an autonomous parliament. I believe Sardinia has one as well, and there may be one other region. It's, it's, fairly, it's fairly unusual. One surprise to me, because you've heard about Sicily forever and had these you know, thoughts in my imagination, how far it is. I mean, it was a 30- or 40-minute flight from from Rome, it's not just an island sitting that you can it's, see. It's down there. If you go all the way down into Calabria, you can actually take a ferry across the Strait of Messina um, from the from Scylla to Char- no from yeah from Scylla to Charybdis. So that's actually where the these sea sirens were, you know, bringing the Greek mm-hmm. sailors down. Um, and there are there are islands that are under you know it's part part of the part of the region of sicily they have there are also lots of minor islands which are really gorgeous fun to visit and have specific food traditions and pantelleria is one of them y'all may know that from the capers that grow there or even um 
the uh, some of the kind of more dessert wines that come out of Sicily are uh, grown from Zibibo grapes in Pantelleria. Pantelleria is closer to Tunisia than it is to Rome. So you are down there, you know, you're, you turn on the radio and you're getting, you know, real different tunes coming out mm. of North Africa on the radio. You are someplace else. It's And it's really, that, that actually is what spurred my move to Italy. Um, I have relatives in Sicily and I was there in the late 90s and it it was just like the last frontier of Europe like you are not in Paris anymore you know you're not <laughs> in Venice it is someplace else and then there's Morocco and then there's Morocco <laughs> Food, food's good down there too the Mediterranean basin has so much to offer um, with just such good food and as you read about almost daily and I'm, I don't know if it's just me maybe this is how my feed is populated but the Medita- Mediterranean diet does not cease to get news coverage, literally weekly, because that is such a healthy way of eating. And it's so kind of fun because um, it's so packed with flavor and you get a lot of variety and you can feel good about it because it's all good for you. Uh, break down the idea of the Mediterranean diet for our listeners. So Mediterranean diet is not necessarily a strict diet. It's literally a way of eating and it's kind of a lifestyle. And I mean, it's pretty simple cooking and it's literally just using um seasonal ingredients so you know what's fresh and a lot of people have gardens or i mean i you know i can i go buy my i don't even go to the farmer's market i literally go buy vegetables from some folks you know who grow the vegetables you just go to their little you know it's not even a farm, really. I mean, they have a, they have a little farm, a little farm shop, I guess is what it is. Um, so, you know, you can get super fresh vegetables. And we eat a lot of um, grains. People are paying a lot of attention now to heritage grains and eating, you know, wheat um, from basically, you know, pre, pre-hybrid seeds. So sort of pre-World War II um, wheat varieties which is you know super healthy processed in a certain way so that it's a it is a whole grain um which has you know low glycemic index it's actually really good for you i mean that kind of plays a huge part in the diet olive oil brings everything together and so there's just this um people really do it without thinking about it and you know pasta for example in italy is a really good way to get your grains and your vegetables and you can throw together a really you know, kind of abundant and flavorful meal in about 10 minutes. And that's the staple. Um, So it's just um, kind of like, you know, comfort food that's also good for you. Now, is the Italian unspoken rule of no more than three ingredients also sort of part of the Mediterranean thing that Carol was asking about or different? The three ingredient rule is more Tuscany. Um, The Tuscans um, tend to use very few ingredients. The farther south you go, the more adventurous they get. So, yes, Sicily does not use three ingredients. They pack it in with flavor. So the Tuscan way of cooking, though, is really interesting in that um, the quality of the ingredients really shines. So, I mean, even they'll, you know, they'll eat a steak, and um, the Tuscans are sort of known for their steak. Y'all probably heard of the Florentine steak, um, Big T-Bone. And they will generally grill that quite rare generally um sometimes in a restaurant they'll even refuse to do it anymore for you so (laughs) if you want your meat cooked better then order something else you're not having meat tonight um but the steaks are generally in the butcher you know if you go to the butcher they'll say the butcher will say well do you want a steak from a female cow or a male cow that's how you that's how they'll start your buying process to get a steak and then they of course you know slice it to order um but and they'll tell you how to grill it which is nothing on it whatsoever you know a few minutes on each side and then stand it up on the bone end and then when it right when it comes off salt black pepper olive oil let it rest for a second and off you go so season at the very end before eating. Very end. Is there a rest period after? There's it's... a slight rest after mm-hmm. you put the salt, pepper. Yeah, salt, pepper, olive oil, let it rest for a minute. And they also, and this is, I find this kind of interesting. It makes sense. It's kind of charming. A steak is never a one-person meal. It's, mm-hmm. it's for the mm-hmm. table. Yeah, I like that idea. Sure. And uh, please tell me more about the male versus female cow and what, how one has a preference. Well, the female cow has tends to be a little um, less flavorful, but more tender. Okay, 
Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Did you know that, Carol? I did not, Malcolm. I didn't know that. I think that we're going to get thrown out of the butcher <laughs> shop around here if we ask for it. <laughs> you know, the butcher shop visit is so dang interesting. It's just... And I've been on several with you, and it is so dang that. interesting. <laughs> So they want like they want to know, right? I mean, it's just not like walk in and say, "I want a pound of that." It's no. far more engaging. It's than very that. engaging, and you also, I t- I've gotten several good recipes just from the old ladies who are sitting in the corner right. hanging out. <laughs> and you don't also. I, I'm also I'm kind of handicapped though. I can't. I don't know what cuts I use for which recipes because the way you order your cut of meat is you tell them what you're making, and then they oh. decide what you need. So for lasagna. If you were to make a lasagna, they would give you some sort of ground. Right. But are there varieties of what ground meat you might get? Is it male, female? Is that it would be more. They would look at fat content. Fat on that. content. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they definitely, and they're good about that. And they might even throw in, of course, if you're going to make meatballs, which, in fact, they don't because it's Tuscany. They don't do that. So only but meatballs. They don't make meatballs in, no. in Sicily. No. Okay. No. Well, that's no, not true. In Excuse Sicily. Me. In Tuscany, they do not. Um, in Sicily... Oh, so in Sicily, they make polpette, and in Tuscany, they make polpettone, which is basically meatloaf. So they, they'll, you know, they, no meatballs, but they got meatloaf. Um, Sicily will, you still see it sometimes, and I don't see it very often. You sometimes find these little mini meatballs, mm-hmm. either just fried and you kind of just eat them like popcorn, or you might find them layered in a lasagna. This is kind of more Calabria. And then in Sicily, and I have seen this exactly one time. Um, exactly. My cousin's mother-in-law used to make meatballs floating in red sauce, which I literally saw that once. My, I've been in Italy for since the year 2000. I've seen that one time. But she served it, and this is quite typical. Um, your first course was um, spaghetti or whatever, pasta, with red sauce. And then you got a new plate for your second course, and there was a meatball on it. And you actually see that also in Naples. They'll do the same thing. Meatballs are a thing. and. I had meatballs in Rome, mm-hmm. but they were three on a plate. Three on a plate with a sort of a brown sauce on them. Interesting. That was kind of just probably the pan drippings kind of thing. Uh-huh. That's how they don't really eat them on top of pasta. And no, no, they were just on a plate. On a plate, and it's definitely I guess Rome down. And I'm thinking I actually did a one of my virtual visits to Naples, and we made meatballs, and they are wonderful. They're wonderful, um, kind of a fun dinner, and you don't even have to have the pasta. It's very good. So uh, about red sauce, I know the, some the Sicilians that I know in the Delta, are, are, they make gravy. pasta gravy on Sunday. So what is a typical uh, Sicilian red sauce, and how long does it take to cook? I have these visions of it cooking all day and grandma in the kitchen. This is an interesting question because, all right, first of all, again, I remember I said I go for the minutiae. Remember that there were no tomatoes in Italy before this, uh, Christopher Columbus landed over here in the Americas. So in the, you know, the historical memory in you know, the Mediterranean basin goes back thousands of years. So 1492 was yesterday. Um, but tomato sauce, it took, the tomatoes did not become a popular ingredient until into maybe 1520s. Um, but it, then it just obviously took off, and we really equate tomato sauce with Italy. Um, so they make a lot of very quick tomato sauces, which we tend not to do over here. Like a pan sauce. Like a pan sauce. The mm-hmm. Sicilians will. The Sicilians have a, a version of this, and that I'm, I'm, I'm sure other regions have similar versions of more of a sauce sauce that you would actually sort of, you know, you make it when all your tomatoes are coming in, and you can put it up for winter. You can make passata, which is just basically. Um, tomato sauce that are tomatoes that have been boiled take the skin off and run it through a food mill so it's just the pulp of a tomato nothing else in it and people will put that up for winter so then you can then proceed from there but not cooked just running it through the food and put it in the jar exactly and then you can also just put up tomatoes that way um take the skin off and put the whole tomatoes in or you can make what they'll in in tuscany they call it pomarola and it's a cool sauce because they will let this is you know height of summer they'll put um, in a pot, um, tomatoes, celery, 
carrots, some onion, uh, maybe a little bit of hot pepper if you want, some sweet basil, no water or anything else. You put a top on it and a little bit of olive oil and then let it just boil down so the tomatoes release all their liquid and everything cooks in the tomato liquid. And then you run that through a food mill. So you get this um, very flavorful, very kind of smooth uh, tomato sauce. And Sicilians do something similar, but they use more kind of garlic and a lot of basil and hot pepper. So that's cool. But that's different from what like a... uh a pizza sauce. That's a different type of... Well, the passata could be your pizza sauce. Could be. Sauce. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Exactly. Wow. Now we know, Mal. We know so much more than we did, Carol. Mal, I want us to put up tomatoes. Okay. Uh, we'll take, tomato a, we'll take a swing at it this summer. I have I ordered a food. I have a food mill. Okay. So we can do it. That is super handy. That is a super handy utensil. You can mm-hmm. also use it to make, you know, I don't know, blackberry jelly or something. All right, folks, we got to go. That's our show. We are so happy, Elaine, that you came to be with us today. Thank happy you so to be much. Here. Always welcome here. Deep South Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio, and we are funded by generous contributions from folks like yourself, and we thank you. Our show is produced by Java Chapman. For my co-host, Carol Palmer, special guest, Elaine Trigiani. I'm Malcolm White, and we ask that you now stay tuned for Marshall Ramsey's show, Now You're Talking, followed by Southern Remedy at 11 a.m. And please join us every Monday and every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for more Deep South Dining, heard right here on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.